Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of Just Another Kill Team Podcast, connecting Kill Team communities across the globe. Your hosts today are me, I'm Jason. And I'm Travis, regular co-hosts. We connect with all sorts of different people, TOs, uh, competitive players, and just um, anyone else that has something interesting to say that they message us and convince us to talk about on an episode. Yeah, we do like making the world a little bit smaller, one hobbyist at a time. We do have a Discord and a Patreon, which is definitely some stuff that you should check out if you enjoy our content. And if you do enjoy this podcast, make sure to share it with your friends who play Kill Team, because... The more, the merrier. We've got June. Is June your name, or how do you want to be referred to in the podcast? Um, yeah, say June. That's it's fine with me. All right, June. It is uh, our first German guest. My name is, my name is uh, Matthias. Um, the real name is Matthias, but uh, in all my gaming career and all the in the internet, it's always been June. So, all right. Yeah, I mean, whichever one you would prefer. So, yeah. And following the theme of all of our other podcasts, we're going to Germany to check in on the kill team scene. <laughs> nice. So you uh, you two are going to move, going to uh, make holidays uh, in Germany? Germany? Germany was cool. I like Germany. I was only there for like four days. Yeah. The techno Depends was nice. Depends on where you are. <laughs> I was yeah. in Berlin for, yeah, we just visited Berlin and then, then we we're off, off to other parts of Europe. Of course. Okay. Yeah, Berlin is Hol crazy. Holocaust Museum was both very cool and very sobering. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and oh, the, nice. unfortunately, the, the most uh, of the Kill Team stuff in Germany isn't in Berlin and around. Mm -hmm. But on the other end, on the western end of Germany, where no okay. one can afford to travel. <laughs> yeah. Are there, is there not like a big games workshop scene in the larger cities or like a miniature gaming scene? Uh, yeah, for 40k and and Age of Sigma, I bet. But Kill Team is really under underrepresented in in Berlin and the area around it. Oh, interesting. So there's, there's maybe one one or two guys that uh, regularly do tournaments there, but it's really really rare. Uh, yeah. the, does the West End of Germany like travel into Berlin to go play at these tournaments, or is it like there's like two separate two separate scenes in Germany right now? Uh, it feels like it's uh, like that. Yeah, it's two separate. It's east, east and west coast of Germany. Yeah, because it's just too far to go with the car when you. I mean, most people have kids and work and stuff, and when you you don't drive like five hours for uh for four games of kill team and then drive back home or or pay for a hotel or something, it's just too far. So it's kind of like a. Have you guys done like one big German tournament yet to try to bring everybody into one spot? Yeah, um, actually, in mid August there uh, will be something in Berlin, where okay. uh, this is the first two day event I have uh, read on our uh, on our Discord mm -hmm. for Germany, and I'll be also also be there. And it's in Berlin because um, I live in Leipzig, which is like a three hours drive with the car south from berlin so that's really that's close for for me close enough to go there and do you have people from like your local scene going with you to like compete in the tournament see the other see the other people in germany yeah it uh, it i had some some um how to say that i had to convince them that it's cool but i got some friends of mine um, they are driving with me nice and that we was it we made we made up a nice new team name, which I'm really proud of, and it's Carp Demon. <laughs> uh, although not, none of us plays uh, um, Chaos or Traitor Marines or something, but Carp Demon <laughs> sounded nice. <laughs> seize the demons. Well, you could be, you know, Imperials going to go seize the demons to lock them up, right? Yeah. <laughs> Nice, nice, nice. So you're one of the local TOs in your area, which is not in Berlin. You want to talk a little bit about your scene before we kind of hop into some of the more uh, nitty gritties for teams? Yeah, of course. 
Um, it's uh, pretty new to myself, actually, because it just started maybe a year ago. And I was struggling to, to find some people to play Kill Team with me. And uh, I went to the local game store, but it's really, there weren't so many people. And then I got a tip that there's a, there's a club in our city where you can meet with people and play all sorts of games, tabletop games. So I went there and I was the only one playing Kill Team. And a um, little over a year, a year later, there's people that greet me with my name and I don't know who they are, but they know who I am <laughs> because it spread it slowly. And yeah, it's really more and more people come to, to play this game. It's cool. And I I don't know if it's if, if it's too braggy to say that, but... When I joined this club there, really no one no one had an idea of the game and I started to, sh to show it to people and then it, and it grew so big that it's it's now that we are that we are making tournaments ourselves. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So you like brag away. Yeah, exactly. Um, are you doing like weekly game nights? Well, there has been times when when new boxes come out or so then then every day there's someone on in, on our little WhatsApp group or Discord who wants to have a game. If you wanted, you could have any day of the week you could have a game of Kill Team. And I um I think twice a week at least I'm there to play. Nice. So you're a big part of you were a big part of like the week to week grind, because I know that's a big common thing that we've had for people interested in starting up their own scenes. You know, you got to be there to make sure that when someone is curious, there's someone who at least can play the game with them. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and that's why everyone uh, greets me with with name and asks me, um, can you say how is this rule and that rule? And, and how do you play this? and that? Yep. That classic like founder of the club situation. The thing is that. Uh, our, our uh, rooms are really nice. Um, it's um, most people there play 40k and Age of Sigma, and we have those mm -hmm. giant, big tables. It's like yeah. it's, it's it's huge. <laughs> I think the old table sizes were like four by sixes, and then they've slowly transitioned to 44 by 60s. So you know, if you if they have the old Warhammer table sizes, they're huge. They're massive tables. Yeah. yeah. It's you can set up two really kill like team it. games on each one of those tables. Yeah, it's it's so important because uh, last weekend we had our uh, local uh, game store tournament, and we had uh, three rounds with six players, and the boards on three tables were really um, as as big as the table. It was really annoying because the the, the board just fit fitted on the on the table and, and nothing else. <laughs> it was really stressful for me because you have your cards you have your tokens the dice and rule books and everything yeah you need yeah, i think when, when we had something similar we made sure that there were chairs basically so at least you could put all of the extra stuff you weren't using underneath the chair and then your cards kind of slide underneath the board in between the tables so they overhang a little bit yeah but i i really i, I was so um i was so happy that those people that came to us to Leipzig when we made our first tournament, they were so um, they were so amazed by the by the by the size of the, the boards because we have those huge 40k tables and then we have those game mats mm. um, made of um, I don't know jungle terrain um, you know like a mm -hmm. green meadow or you have a desert thing and on those mats I built the, uh, the small <laughs> boards fitting with the colors and everything. Yeah, and you could really see that the, the people weren't used to that. They were used to sitting on a small uh, office chair. And yeah. And you built a lot of your boards for Kill Team, right? And I think when we were setting this up, you sent us a couple of pictures of your customized boards. So yeah. players were probably not ready for that level of production value, I assume, at their local tournament. Well, for the local tournament, I used the, the, the official boards. I am, yeah. I didn't put the boards uh, for the tournament because there would be too many uh, rules shenanigans, I guess. Because Kill Team is it's a really complex thing and it's sometimes it gets really sweaty in the competitive uh, scene and it's really about millimeters and, and blah. And when I had my own boards there and made a little tree that's maybe a little bit too crooked, <laughs> I couldn't, I didn't want to argue with the, <laughs> with the people there. So I used the normal boards. 
I see, I see. But it was all into the dark uh, um, terrain. Oh, all yeah. into the dark tournament. Yeah, so with the boards that you're making, are you making like custom into the dark stuff or are you making custom open stuff? I'm making custom open stuff. But uh, I really thought about what I could tell you about those boards because it's it's really sad that we don't use them so often because um, it's kind of a narrative thing and you have to build a story around it and you have to really play the board and kill team is the most competitive game i i know in the in this tabletop scene and it's really it's really about yeah it's competition and the board is like it's like secondary it's not so important for the game you know yeah but what i want to say is i can't get people to play on my boards <laughs> Like they want, they want the more official setting yeah. where the line of sight is defined by the terrain. I, it's definitely one of the things that I don't think is super obvious to people when they pass by kill team players is when you start getting more competitive, those every small thing counts. Like part of the reason why I'm excited for the WTC terrain is because there's like for MDF terrain normally the straight edges are just like not fun to play on because you, you're either in cover or not in cover and there's nothing in between. So on Octarius, when you get line of sight, you can get cover from these tiny corners and it can feel a little lame, but it also is really important for forcing people to interact with the terrain, which is a big part of Kill Team. So customized yeah. terrain can be kind of rough in that scenario, right, June? Right. And then you would always uh, be called judge what can i do now here and what what is this uh, building is this heavy or not so when everyone plays uh, octarius and everyone plays uh, into the doctor and then we're all on the same size uh, side and i just yes. today had an, an hour-long conversation about those octarius buildings because after all those years it's still not clear how many inches you count when climbing over the little rampart on top of the buildings <laughs> and it really was an you endless know? discussion <laughs> the the raw discussion on it is that there are parts of it that it'll be six inches because they're like 4.2 inches. And then on other parts, basically where the ramparts drop down, it is obviously four inches because it's like a three inch wow. climb. Wow, but, but that's really sweaty. Yeah, it is. It is sweaty. Inches. But you obviously one of the big parts of being a TO and actually having a good tournament experience is actually making sure that people ask you questions so that you can clarify things as early as possible. Of course. Because yes, it can be very sweaty, especially when it comes to the Octarius ramparts. When you have to climb over the long side, they are just over four inches. So I've heard TO say it's just four inches with scalable, which is defensible. And I've also had people just play it as, you know, it's a six inch climb when you're not at the the under the divot or for 25 millimeter bases. There's a handful of spots where you can climb over. So it really is one of those things where if you don't know, ask the TO and hopefully the TOs know that some of these conversations need to happen. Yeah, it's just not clear clear enough from the rules, you know, because the, those little ramparts they are uh, differently thick on on the on the top of the roof. So you could argue that a twenty five millimeter base cannot move uh, with one inch over there. You need two inches to move, and then you cannot dash up the thing. And yeah, it's complicated. <laughs> yeah, it definitely. I, is. I've always just been like. Um, it's traversable, which you don't pay when you climb, and when you drop, you do. Right. Um, and that's just. But where it's I never edit. explained why you do this like this. It, it, it just isn't explained. But yeah, let's play it like that. <laughs> I do like that the rule set is robust enough where if you just follow along with what they're saying, where you have to round up in increments of two, it all works. It's just sometimes you get to a position where it just feels weird. You're like, oh, this is going to cost me six inches to climb now. Is that right? And it's like. By letter of the law, yes. Yeah. Uh, but players don't have to do that if both players agree or the TO tells them one way or the other. One of the things that I like doing in my tournaments is people will ask me questions and I will give them the letter of the law. And if you ask me how to play it, that's how we'll play it. But if both players agree at the beginning of the game that they want to treat the walls as a four inch climb, I can't really stop them because I'm not going to sit there and watch the entire game. I will tell players that if I am going to do this, if I hear a player pressure them one way or the other, then I will like they they will be in trouble just because yeah. there is the letter of the law. And then there's also what people want to play. Yeah, it's what I did in, in the tournament that I um, I made. I made a little tournament package like a like a little book and I even printed it for for my my dudes. 
and there it was really clear how uh, which terrain is ruled and everything was i mean nobody read it <laughs> but it was there <laughs> the pain the true pain of a to you do all the stuff and people don't read it that's how i felt too <laughs> no but but i i like doing that you know it's 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 a piece of art in the end uh, the book also it's just it's no stress for me to do that yeah, we have a packet on our Discord that we gave out to a couple of TOs. That's just like when I initially started running tournaments, I wrote out like a skeleton on like sl Google Slides so people can fill stuff in and have a backdrop. But at the end of the day, in my experience over like two or three years of running tournaments, it's like maybe, maybe like 5% of the people will read the packet. <laughs> yeah. Well, we, we tried to make it a little bit interesting with uh, a narrative uh, frame around it. So we had a little story about a space hulk evolving from nowhere and everybody wants to grab the, the goodies mm. inside of it. So we tailored it around around a little story. Nice, nice. That's cool. What was the so you said you had six people at this in the dark tournament? No, that's uh, was last uh, last Saturday was the local store tournament, which mm. is six people, it was just our friends. Okay. Um, and in March, we had a 12-player tournament, which I advertised on, on this German uh, tournament uh, website. Nice. And uh, yeah, and this was, I didn't know if it uh, would, would work, but after like 24 hours, all the 12 um, slots were booked. And yeah, and it wasn't so complicated as I thought. I thought it's a huge investment and a huge uh, organizing thing, but it turned out. It was all fine. Everybody had a good time. We bought too much food. Nobody ate all the food. <laughs> and also, I thought it would be much more complicated to score the the um, the Swiss system thing with the BCP app and stuff. And it was really easy. Yeah, I mean, luckily, best coast pairings at this point is relatively straightforward. There's a lot of settings, but you can just kind of fire it out of the box, and it's you know, no one's going to notice <laughs> at the end of the day. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so you've had six to 12 person tournaments. Uh, who won that 12 person tournament? I think that might be kind of interesting because Germany feels like it's kind of like a nascent scene. You guys are still growing. Uh, obviously, mm -hmm. I don't think there were any German players at the World Championships last year. So hopefully this year you guys have plans to get a golden ticket or maybe it's the Berlin tournament in August has a golden ticket. Well, um, the guys of the there's one big uh, kill team Germany discord. Mm -hmm. And I read about uh, in the TO section that there was an event where you could win an, a golden uh, ticket mm -hmm. because some other dude from, from America was involved. But I, I didn't follow up on that, so I don't really know uh, which event this would be. But uh, uh, interestingly, the, the Dwarves won our Into the Dark 12-man tournament. <laughs> okay. Were you playing on the Dwarves? No, I was playing Corsairs. Mm. Because I I may I, I main Corsairs still because I just love love the team and I I went fourth place with Corsairs and it was a good one because I made the the trophies I built the trophies myself so I did not come in, into the situation where I have to hand a trophy that I made myself to myself so fourth place was best. Excellent. Perfect outcome. <laughs> yeah, there was no there was no little meme of you handing your trophy to yourself. Yeah. <laughs> and it's a perfect Corsair's placing as well. They were oh, yeah, right in the, the middle. Team. They're they're perfectly yeah. balanced team in our week to week day <laughs> stats. Yeah, it's it's just like that. It's a shame that you cannot win a tournament, but you never lose a tournament either. So <laughs> But one day I will win a tournament with Co with Corsairs. I mean, you've and got your tournament um, coming up that you're traveling for. Hopefully, that one that one's the one. Yeah, I'm. I'm. Uh, I want to try Mandrakes out, but I have the um, the fear that they are really OP right now, and then winning wouldn't feel as good if you just stomp everyone because they are like crazy, have crazy rules that, that get nerfed down in some months. I think even if they are OP right now, it's it's a it takes it's a learning curve to learn i mean i i've kind of been uh, a little bit like not playing as many games i've just, i played corsairs or uh mandrakes a couple times lately but like even the game where mandrakes totally kicked my butt i was like this is a very <laughs> like playable game um 
I don't know. My opinion is they're they're fair and fun for now until someone like completely annihilates me and shows me how much they are to be hated like that guard. Yeah. Yeah, I have yet to play a game against them or with them. Yeah, and, I think uh, ultimately the eight wounds the eight wounds and just kind of being squishy will get them just as bad as Corsairs get got. Like at the top end of the table, they are pretty squishy. Yeah. But um what I want to say is um, that I was playing Hearthkin for a time now, and it was a really a huge step, so to speak, from a team that has a free dash and can uh, pump up its movement to a, a seven normal move and four move dash. And then you go to the dwarves, which only have five movement. Yeah. Yeah, five movement with a six hard. inch charge. Right. <laughs> So you really you really have to plan your plan your advances and plan your positioning. Whereas Corsairs and Space Marines and some of these three APL teams, there's a lot more like squishiness around where your final model position is because you're off by half an inch. It's really not that bad. But when you only have five inches, every every millimeter counts. Yeah, and you you cannot afford to uh, to play it easy. You cannot say, okay, I'm passing with this operative. You cannot do that because then you're missing out on the on scoring. And the worst thing is with uh, dwarves is loot, an open board loot. You just you can't you cannot do this. <laughs> yeah, I mean you can. You would uh, have to overcommit and suicide your your guys. At least that's my experience. I played in, in the local tournament. I played uh, versus Hyrotech on Octorius open board. And I just could not get onto the middle objectives. I, it, it just wasn't possible without risking too much. And then uh, at the end of TP2, I, I saw that I, I, I could not reach them. And I went 4 2 in both the first turning points. So this was basically over then. <laughs> It's definitely a common thing that I've heard for Hearthkin players is that you need to have a plan for your jump pack warrior because he is going to be the best model to go get those far objectives. And you cannot put him in a dangerous position. You need to look at the board, figure out which midboard position is safe for him to use. And if you need to take a normal move, fly over to the position, grab the button and then dash, you need to make sure that the comms is ready to go and do the thing or be ready to burn an APL to go get your free free action yeah that's cool but you only have two apl and you i mean he moves fast but he needs the comms buff to to, to loot an objective mm -hmm. and he needs the, he needs another apl for picking up an item or something yeah so if he if he's so far away from the comms guy in tip in turning point two then yeah you, you can't score. Yeah, so you it know, really that's... does just like pigeonhole you into like the only way to play is the comms guy buffs your jetpack guy so he can get the midboard objective. And if you don't do that <laughs> at all, you're like really on an uphill battle. Unless like, I don't know, maybe there's a way to just like plan to go 2-4 twice and then 4-2 twice and max your tack ops and then hope for a tie. Yeah, but uh, if, if your opponent also maxes his tack ops. Um... Yeah, then you're just going to get a tie. Yeah, that you know, you have also the lugger, which has a free mission action. That's also mm -hmm. cool, but that's only one one guy. Yeah, and you definitely want a your, good tool, uh, though. Your, Very important. Yeah, but you want your your comms guy to buff the other gu the gunners, so you you can uh, use the ancestors thing more than once. You know, as a, if you give um, an already activated model uh, another APL, then you can go in the next turning point with three APL shooting. Yeah. And yeah, you cannot buff the the, the jetpack dude. Yeah, the bummer is exactly that. You can't you can't have your three APL shooting and your scoring. Yeah, we ruled it for I mean, our little tournament that we, we said we play loot on open. So we had, we had th all three boxes. We had uh, open board, we had into the dark, and beta decima. And we ruled it that uh, you can only play capture on beta decima because. Um, because of how the the thing is uh, is is made, you don't score as much primaries on this map for whatever reasons. Uh, reason, so we said it's capture on beta decima, secure on into the dark, and loot on open board. That's actually kind of an interesting way to balance beta decima existing at least at least as far as competitive play, because it is one of the big issues of the terrain. You know, when we talk to talk to Jay the Sloth. In Australia, he had Beta Decima and he switched Beta Decima and Open Play. Basically, because Beta Decima scores differently, everybody had to play on Beta Decima. 
But if you have beta decima and you try to average out the score, so you score a little bit more points, maybe that's another way that you can make it work. Recently, I tried to let people swim, and I thought that worked out reasonably well. It seemed like people had fun with it. I really want to try that. I'm kind of uh, sad that I didn't buy the box now, because now with the Nemesis box, you have this huge um, terrain piece in the middle. And then if you look at the shadow ops in the book, it's really it looks really interesting. And maybe there's another box coming up with more uh, uh, terrain, which you can also um, mix and match on the board. Yeah, it's kind of interesting, you know, from a conceptual standpoint. In the Dark was a box, like a set of terrain that you didn't need help for to make it work because the rules were tight enough and there was enough where you could play and all the teams kind of felt like they had enough to do where the extra terrain in the boxes just wasn't necessary. But Beta Decima, yeah. on the flip side, is a set of terrain where there's not enough in the box. So every time one of these boxes comes out and they have extra terrain, it actually does a little bit to like adjust the play experience on Beta Decima. And I think in a yeah. relatively positive way, like looking at the Nightmare Box, that big piece of plastic actually creates way more playable space, way more heavy terrain, and just gives you the ability to play the game in more interesting ways. And hopefully in this next box with the new pieces of terrain, I've always been the opinion that beta decimas may be missing one or two gantries that just provide you more room to move around so maybe that's what they'll do maybe they'll do something different but it's interesting because beta decima it feels like they're upgrading the play experience with every box but nobody will ever play it because as far as tournaments go no one is playing it yeah everybody just wants like the standardized thing that like it has to come in the box and i totally get that because it's like you can't for for tournament organizers you're not going to like rally up all of these like little random things like unless the community i mean like i thought about that a little bit and i was like if the community if like a community leader was like all right everybody give me all of your beta decima terrain we're gonna put it in like a tournament (laughs) pack and then we show up and then each beta decima has like one of the expansions like maybe that's kind of the way to to do that that was actually one of the reasons why we uh, chose into the dark for our tournament because that terrain was everywhere <laughs> at that time everybody had the box of of uh, of space hulk and also the 40k players had the same thing so we could easily access those those pieces yeah because you, you said the the scene mostly started like a year ago so it was pretty big on like the into the dark season especially then yeah i, I don't know why but everybody who started playing kill team uh uh, looked at this uh, Space Hulk thing and thought, oh, that's also Kill Team? Can we play that? And then it was a real uh, hype in, in this in this little club. Everybody only wants to play Into the Dark. Yeah, because like every single launch for that whole year was like Into the Dark. And, and like that combined with, you know, like people actually liked it. I, I can see how, you know, uh, a scene starting up in Season 2 era would be very Into the Dark heavy. And I'm actually very amused by that. It's also yeah, funny because I think 40k players or like kill team players or any any miniature player is probably like when you first open that door for the first time, there's like a part of your brain that is very satisfied. You're like, ah, <laughs> the terrain actually functions compared to like yeah. how 40k is played normally, which is like, ah, I have this I have the square. You can't shoot through it. I can shoot through it. It's like this is <laughs> it's not super yeah. fun. But when you go to in the dark, you're like, oh, this terrain actually does all the things that terrain is supposed to do. You get way more immersed by just opening a door. Yeah. What do you mean you can open the door? You can open the door? Oh, yeah. I mean, one of the funniest things when people, new random people from board gamers come over to Kill Team is they ask me, like, oh, where can you move? I'm like, you could just move wherever you want. And they're like, I can go diagonally? Like, you can go one inch <laughs> this way, turn another inch. So yeah. a lot of those things are very novel. So I could see how In the Dark could be a very novel experience because 40K players had... I think so, we're boarding boarding actions, I think. And then we have kill, like in the dark. So just yeah. convincing over a couple 40K people is relatively easy, yeah. especially when the terrain drags you in. It's, it's actually a, the exact same amount of terrain pieces in the boarding actions box for 40K than it's in the, in the Into the Dark box. It's exactly the same. It's just two sets of sprues, I think, if I remember correctly. Yeah. And that was cool because uh, everybody gave me uh, his unpainted terrain for Into the Dark because I like I like painting terrain. It's like a medi- meditation thing for me in, in the evening sitting there. And uh, especially this terrain is such a such fun to paint that. I don't know why. It's And I sat there with seven different sets of Into the Dark and I uh, made some concept concept paints for, for one 
piece of terrain. I had a whole white one, which was kind of a, a science vessel uh, lab thing. Um, then I had um, an overgrown jungle into the dark set, where there were uh, so a little, little, um, little, how to say that? Yeah, jungle. You put, like aquarium plants into your into the tray and like exactly. glued onto yeah. the walls and stuff. Yeah, <laughs> include plastic plants onto the walls. <laughs> yeah, I think I've seen I've seen like a Christmas version of In the Dark when I went to a Christmas <laughs> event down in the DC area because there's a regular Christmas event uh, like four hours south of New York. And they do like gingerbread terrain that you can eat, which is fun because you spend a CP and you eat a piece of terrain and it disappears. <laughs> and suddenly your opponent's like, wait a minute, do that for cover. I'm like, sure is it. And then I blew him up with a blast shot. Did, uh, uh, did he do little little stockings on the, on the walls? Uh, there were Christmas lights, at least. So there was like a there was like a red and green Christmas light themed board, which is very, very cool. And then gingerbread, nice. gingerbread scramble terrain, which I ate. Was the name of the ploy to eat the terrain? So, anyways, I started chomping. It should be actually. <laughs> I will tell. I'll tell Ryan next year. I wanted to make a um, a rainbow into the dark set, which was all pink and um, rainbow colored with unicorns um, glued or, or painted to the walls, but I, I couldn't finish it. <laughs> yeah, having painted my fair set of fair share of in the dark terrain. For just you know, just for other events it's a pretty nice set of terrain and it can take a lot of different kinds of schemes pretty quickly because there's obviously a lot of the gw detail but it also looks pretty good with just like a two-tone zenithal with a little bit of extra yeah. stuff thrown in yeah that's what i always say to people who are really lazy on painting especially for terrain you just prime it black and then dry brush it with a met metal color and it looks fantastic mm -hmm. you don't have to do much more so it sounds like you've been playing a fair bit of in the dark terrain, or does your group play a little bit of everything? Well, like I said, there was a real hype around playing into the dark with the new players who started with Kill Team because I think it was easier for them um, at first because getting shot off from from vantage points is really depressing <laughs> if you don't know the rules. So they said, "Oh no, uh, let's go to uh, the space. It's more it's more comfortable for us." So and then, yeah. Then we I mean, arguably, forty k is basically a two D game. So it makes sense that forty k players are like, let's not yeah. get shot in three D space. Let's go back to the a box where I can't get shot. But then after the tournament, there was kind of a, a backlash because we played so much of that uh, terrain because we were practicing and every every day was into the dark. And then the tournament was into the dark, and everybody was like exhausted on those things. So. Now we only play uh, open board and try the beta decima, but we can't really we can't really get around it. It's it's just too annoying. Sure, and, and you know I of your two of the two teams that you've talked about, Corsairs and Hearthkin. Which team do you enjoy playing more on in the dark, and which one do you play more on open? Hmm. Or is it Corsairs for both? It's Corsairs are absolute monsters in Into the Dark. And on open, they are also good. But um, I, that, that, that's what I wanted to tell you. I, when I started with Kill Team, I started with uh, Tabletop in general and Kill Team in, in t by the second edition in 2021. 20, that's when I first ever played Tabletop Team, Tabletop game. And then I thought, which, which team could be cool? And I picked Pathfinders. <laughs> and it was really not the beginning of friendly faction. And it was so overwhelming for me that I didn't. I, I I painted the model and everything, and I read the books, but I I couldn't play it because it was so. It was like a paralysis for me. So I thought uh, I will fuck this up. I cannot play fourteen or thirteen at that time. I, I can't do this. I'm gonna forget mm -hmm. everything. So then I started to play Space Marines because six six models are way easier <laughs> to handle. Sure. But yeah, that's definitely true. When I when I got the grasp of the Pathfinders. That I really like to play them um, on open board. Uh, Into the dark, not so, <laughs> not so much. It's it's kind of funny now because I think it's swung all the way back around with all of the changes over the last year. Pathfinders on In the Dark are actually quite scary, just because at some point someone is going to have to go next to light cover and they're going to go try to touch an objective, and then that operative is dead. Yeah, but it's kind I, of swung all the way back around because on open on Octarius. A lot of objectives are covered by heavy terrain, and now Pathfinders don't want you next to heavy terrain, you know? Yeah. 
But I don't really know why the Pathfinders were, were buffed. Did they really need that? I don't know. We, we may never know. Yeah. Um, so I'm always trying to mention uh, Kao Yan, if I can remember to say that instead of Mont Kao, which I always say, because that's the big one. Um, that lets you do yeah. free mission actions, right? It does yeah. let you do a free mission action. So just And retain two cover saves. I just want to say that for Into the Dark, open doors for free and shoot from the cover of the door and retain two. Maybe there's something there. Yeah, of course. And uh, I think GW didn't uh, didn't notice that uh, how the rules are written right now, you can make two marker light actions in one activation with one guy. Because you can go on guard on concealed and you can marker light out of your activation, basically. So you can you can take a tau, put two marker lights on one with a high intensity marker lights and then go on guard and then uh, marker light again in uh, in the uh, in the guard. I absolutely have gotten good use out of that at the World Championships. <laughs> oh man, this is the first time <laughs> I've heard anyone know. say they that. Watch, yeah, it's it's actually quite good. So, I mean, they're, like I said, I think Pathfinders on In the Dark are actually better than they are on Open with how I've seen most Open boards get designed right now. Because most Open boards now, there's plenty of heavy everywhere on all of the important things, so it's just harder for you to actually be able to pull off a shot that your opponent isn't expecting. Whereas on In the Dark, at some point, your opponent is going to have to walk into a trap. And sometimes the yeah. trap is, I put a dude inside a room and he, he put four marker lights on you. <laughs> yeah. It's insane. But, yeah. you know, as far as, like, the teams that you've been really into, you know, I think we're curious about how you've been playing Hearthkin. It sounds like maybe there have been, been some struggles for you, but you've probably also hit some high points because, obviously, it's hard to keep playing teams unless you find something good in them. What's one big play or combo that you've really enjoyed on Hearthkin? Yeah. I really don't know why I, I, uh, I liked them so much in the end because when the box came out first, I thought... Are you kidding me? We're playing goats versus dwarves. Is this is this kill team even anymore? Um, what is this? <laughs> I couldn't really. Uh, I didn't play those two teams for like a year or so. But then I had a, a game against Hearthkin, and I, and I saw what they can do. And it's basically um, from the spirit, uh, just like Pathfinders. It's a huge toolbox where you can pick a, a solution for every problem you're facing, basically, at least on paper. And the, there's, there are many funny plays with the, with the dwarves. For the first that comes uh, to mind is the, is the beam guy, you know, where you can put a straight line and everybody gets mortals on that line. I, I didn't manage to pull it off uh, yet because heavy stops this, uh, this line to make mortals. But mm -hmm. it's, it's such a cool thing to, to take your... I mean, everybody in our uh, community has this uh, laser liner, and then we are standing there, everybody with a laser. And can you can you pull this line through all the bases? And it's just just a cool thing. And um, the the sad thing is the, the guy I'm like most is is the dozer guy because he has such a it's such a cool model, and on paper it sounds so good, but I never take him because he's never uh, he, he's never really of value in a game. See the when punchy to, guy? It's, it's the yeah. punchy guy with the knuckles, with the plasma knuckles or whatever. <laughs> plasma knuckles. He's the Dragon Ball Z guy. Actually, on that topic, you know, Ace was on here, I think somewhat almost a year ago, talking about Hearthkin, playing them mostly on In the Dark. And one of the big combos there was you could do the Nux Smash to push people into a beam line. So if you're having trouble catching the beam, try to keep those two together. And then you could have the Dozer run into a room, knock a dude into another spot and have your last action be the beam, go over and nuke the dudes. So that was definitely a thing that he was doing. I, on Into the Dark, uh, it, has a, it has a value, of course. But then you have to leave at home another one that's also important. Maybe the, the, the guy who prevents every pre-game movement, the, the locator, or the other guy with the marker, or who you're going to leave at home. So, I mean, you might crazy. lose the Cognitar just because the Cognitar is a bunch of rerolls. I suspect that's a hard sell for a lot of players. Or, you know, if you're playing a more melee-centric team, the field medic is not nearly going to be as useful. So you can toss the field medic for another melee specialist. Yeah, I never play the medic, to be honest. Uh, also an interesting thing. The medic is very, very important. So just as a heads up for anyone listening who doesn't like medics, because I've heard <laughs> this opinion a lot, 
medics are very powerful in shooting matchups because what you can do is set up early aggressive shooting pieces to cover rooms as long as there's a medic next to them your opponent has to spend two activations and you are basically at no risk in those time periods so i know it's come up a lot when i play against other vet guard players who've never used the medic medics are very very powerful but only in shooting matchups yeah and except your uh, enemy your opponent has blast because if the medic gets hit in the blast as well and dies then he cannot save uh, the gunner or everybody else Yeah. Yep, the blast is always a great counter to the medics in case you are uh, running into that with, you know, someone's trying to pull the, the shenanigans that Travis is mentioning and you could just blast them. Yeah. Yeah, it's like a safety net, but I, uh, it's kind of uh, you have an operative that is babysitting your gunner. It's it feels like a, like a waste in some way for me because the, the medic also has to be in three inch every time. He has to like run behind your gunner so like yeah yeah i get it um like his mom <laughs> yeah yeah he's a big babysitter it really is just like if you are gonna do that you gotta know when to use it and he has to be 100 dedicated to that cause but really like it, it can get down to like some good value um but yeah i mean i'm i'm there with you like it's it's not the most glorious of plays yeah it's like the babysitter for your gunner But uh, I wanted to to tell about the other uh, dudes I like really with with, with dwarves. Uh, those five gunners you can pick, they are, they are all in in their own uh, field. They're insane. Like the, the 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 guy with the rocket launcher is basically shooting plasma, uh, just with AP one. I mean, it's five six damage AP one. It's it's just uh, yeah, it's just insane. Yeah, they have really yeah, strong so gunners. The gunners are all, all good. And, and, they can, like, uh, and, and you've got models yeah. that can like freeze people to delay their activations. Is, is that yeah, one specific really guy? Hard to pull off. Yeah, that's the uh, the Cognitar who also prevents the pregame movement. But it's really uh, hard to pull off because he needs line of sight. He needs line of sight, not just visible to pull that freeze thing off. It's actually so your it comms. Been... So the the kin link, basically your comms oh, no, model, link, yeah. can Sorry. also use line of sight to stun a dude, and he is by like the actual last activation for your opposing team. So against elites, this ability is obviously very brutal. Or against teams that are really depending on their cat, like their meltas to get into range. If you can park your dude on advantage or in a good position, you can really screw people up. But on in the dark, where people are generally in cover. Maybe the system jam is not going to get as much use, right? Yeah. But in those situations, at least he's a comms. So it's probably hard to ever go without the comms. Yeah, you need the comms. And if you lose comms in uh, in an early TP, it's really a struggle. But uh, as you said, uh, elites, uh, dwarves versus elites is, uh, is just a, a stomping match. It has been for me, at least. Whenever I played it was Phobos or Intercession or even Justin, Those those dwarfs they just annihilate elites. Yeah, from what I understand about the current matchup spreads, the hearth can love elites just because you have the most P1 and AP yeah. AP1 AP2 in the game, and because yeah. as your opponents kill your first couple of dwarves, you get free crits. Those P1 guns really really slap. Yeah, they super pop off. It goes nuts. Yeah, grudge tokens are insanely powerful. But on the flip side, the wider, shootier teams are generally a little bit rough. And then obviously the melee-centric teams that can hit your line and keep going are also kind of scary. So like Felgor, Commandos have historically been somewhat rough matchups for the team. Have you had yeah. similar experiences? And in those experiences, were there operatives that shine that you wish you could take two of? <laughs> yeah, I wish I could take two Grenadiers. <laughs> And the, the team I struggled the most uh, against was uh, Blooded because they just out-activated me. And it's, I mean, they have some gunners, but it's basically a melee-centric team. And I played the defensive KG waiting game, but that was the, the wrong strategy because in the second turning point, they were just sitting in my in my face, basically. And then just rolled over me. And I never could find a real solution for, for those blooded guys 
Yeah, because they're kind of similar to you in that they're both late game ramp teams where at the towards the end of the game, Blooded have tokens on all of their guys. So they're getting free retains or free crits. And then obviously for the Hearthkin, you have grudge tokens on your opponent. So at towards the end of the game, you're both strong, but they're a little bit stronger out the gate if they are in your face, right? Yeah, but you, you don't have really dedicated melee operatives uh, with Hearthkin. I mean, the, it's very the, much the about medic, space. Medic gets pretty hard with this plasma knife. I mean, you can take more plasma knives nowadays, right? Because if you take the lugger, you can give out eight plasma knives. Or yeah, I think seven plasma knives, because you get an extra five equipment points, right? You, they cost two now, right? They cost two, and the lugger gives you... Six, 15. Or 15, 15 yeah. So you could take seven knives. So you can have everybody have a knife that can... Theoretically, fight a seven wound model. Take a plasma knife. But why would you take seven knives? You just it's... need to stab people. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, the, the big reason. So this is a thing that came up when Ace was here a year ago, talking about Hearthkin, about how the team can be a reasonably good melee centric team, where you know you take like four or five knives, and then your first couple dudes who are standing on the points, they're there to die. But everyone else behind them, they have lethal five, three, five weapons. So against Blooded, you know, you have your first two dudes stand on the far objectives. They die and everyone else is ready to counter charge. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like the overall match does seem like one of the harder ones because they're both late game rampers, but like Blooded can get there and take those four twos. That's way, way harder. Like Hearthkin are going to get a three, three at best. And like, even if you go for the, to the three, three, you're like, you're risking a lot and then they if you both late game ramp and they have the early advantage it's it's pretty stacked against you i think uh, for hearthkin you need to commit uh, in turning point two you need to play them aggressively you need to uh, risk your uh, your operatives you cannot play too defensively yeah so which operatives are you comfortable risking when which ones are you saving to catch up on the grudge catch up with the grudge tokens obviously the plasma beamer is a nice safe one because if you can hit a couple dudes with grudge tokens on them, then you can get a, a guaranteed laser beam. Yeah. But there's got to be other operatives that you're using that you're hoping that they get to fire with a grudge token in play. Yeah, obviously it's the it's the three gunners. I keep I try to keep them as as safe as possible until late game. And of course, the jetpack dude is really important for scoring uh, objectives or scoring uh, tech ops. And I don't know where I heard this. Maybe on 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 another podcast. As someone said, um, the success of your team um, gets gets higher as long as your as longer as your jetpack guy lives. So, if your jetpack guy lives TP three, you have good chance of winning the game <laughs> because he's the most agile piece you have. And yeah, who else? Yeah. Um, my my leader, you won't see my leader until TP3. He's always behind because he's just there to sell out the, the, the tokens. And also those uh, locator and cognitor guys, they just come out later to shoot. Um, sometimes I use them for as, as uh, utility uh, scoring dudes. Yeah, but the, the reroll marker is really strong. It doesn't sound like, like it, but it's really a strong thing. Also the the anti-obscuring marker of the locator it's also pretty strong so if you lose them early it's it's also a problem so you've got a lot of people that like to to skulk until the late game but who's gonna go out there and kick the hornet's nest like who's the one who's the instigator uh, definitely the the grenadier because that guy i mean uh, this ancestors are watching ploy gives you plus one on your ballistic skills right and he, this big fat bomb he's carrying uh, hits on freeze. So if you play the um, proximate firepower ploy, which gives you plus one, he hits on twos. And well, he hits on threes because he's a grenadier. So all of the close range weapons tend to be hitting on threes, not because he, not because like his weapons would hit on threes otherwise. Because I'm pretty sure the grenadier's normal gun profile still hits on fours, but the big explosion. Yeah, yeah. It does hit on three. So if you're within proximate firepower range, it does hit on twos. Right. And then there's this little niche tactic you can pull off. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because uh, he has this uh, little utility grenade token, right? And um, it says in the rules, if you place that token, you can decide for three different options. You can either um, um, make something, you can, I have to say it in English, 
Um, you lessen the movement of your opponent if he steps into the bubble of this utility token. That's the one option. Mm -hmm. The other option is that mission actions cost an additional APL to uh, to do. And the third one is uh, that your weapons gain the uh, range six special rule. So you can use this actually to your advantage because the the big charge bomb of the dwarf um, has a four inch range, and if you put the token just beside you then suddenly you can throw your charge within six. <laughs> yeah, because you'll have the range four and the range six keywords. Yeah. While also shortening the key, like, because I think the intended use for that is you throw it next to your opponent and suddenly their long range guns go to six inch range because it's like a heavy gravity bubble. But in the but by that same token, you are now suddenly making your range a little bit longer. Your opponent might not expect it, right? Yeah, and if you read it, uh, uh, if you read the rules, there's there's nothing uh, um, written like your opponent or the other guys. I mean, like the Phobos mine things, it's it's exactly written like that. That your own dudes, they mm -hmm. don't get hit by by the bombs and mines. But with the dwarves, it's only it. There is um, the sentence is says operatives. If operatives yes. step into the bubble, so it counts for yourself too, and it also has gains. It's it's a good thing, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's a good thing in this exact situation. So you can throw your C8 high explosive charge at two inches longer range, and if you do it with the ancestors are watching, you can get a four inch move, boost yourself, and then chuck the grenade with proximate firepower. And suddenly, now you've gone from a dude with six or a seven inch range or eight inch range or nine inch range, I think, with the five inch move and the four inch throw to a, a full 11 inch throw which your opponent yeah. might not be expecting yeah i like that a lot have you gotten uh, have you caught people out off guard with that yeah i did and it was uh, last week there a friend of mine played uh, justian killed him justian and he made the, the mistake to put two of his uh, space marines in in one inch to each other because it's only one inch blast but mm -hmm. yeah and i made a little um before and after picture you see two space marines and a little dwarf before and uh, after the after picture was just a dwarf because he <laughs> annihilated those two space marines so four attacks on twos range six blast one ap1 you yeah. had the rerolls and nuked a pair of marines huh that was great was this on in the dark for the bonus lethal five up no it was an, an open board oh nice well even better yeah so the Grenadiers got a nice little trick with his uh, Vare 3 utility grenade because, you know, you can juke your opponent without them expecting it. Have there been any other major rules things that you've been able to catch people off guard with? Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's obvious, but people tend to forget the Ancestors thing. Mm. They, it's just like in your mind, it's a two APL team. And then I say, OK, move, dash, shoot. And they like... No, you can't do. You just have two APL, and they say, "Ah, but you forget about my little ploy here." And it's every time it calls people off guard because you just you, you just don't anticipate that they can do that for some reason. I mean, being able to ignore the injury is also a nice thing that your opponent might not expect, right? Like they might remember that it's three APL, but having an injured dwarf, your opponent already is going to discount some of the things they can do, and then suddenly they're at full ballistic skill and they blow a dude up. But you need the, the equipment on your guns to, to have that. No, Ancestors Are Watching also stops you from being injured. Oh, really? It does. Oh, yeah. So until the end yeah. of the activation, that operative isn't injured and can perform a free fighter shoot. So for anyone yeah, who's playing dwarves, don't forget when your Ancestors Are Watching, you are not injured. Nice. I forgot that too. And what I also like is it's um, for the first time uh, I have a team that is where barricades are really important. You can really mm -hmm. do some crazy stunts with your barricades. Because in some yeah, games with other teams, when, when we're in the barricade step, it's like, oh, where do we put them? And then we put them somewhere. And in the end, it's, it's, it's hindering ourselves from playing the game where we, because we put our barricades in bad spots. Mm -hmm. I had games where we put our barricades in our own, de own deployment zone in some corners just to to put them anywhere and don't play with them but with, with dwarves you can do really good stuff because you can yeah, use tell, this tell us a little bit. ploy you can uh -huh. use this ploy um, where you make one terrain piece heavy that is light right you can mm -hmm. use it for light terrain pieces three inch of your deployment zone or on your barricades 
And what I recently uh, learned is that this is a ploy you can play more than once. Correct. You can because it is not like, used inside of the firefight phase. So there is a small yeah. piece of the rules and the core rules right next to where tactical reroll is found, where it talks about when you can or cannot use ploys. Mm -hmm. And it specifically calls out if a tactical ploy is not used during a turning point, it is only limited by the number of command points you have. So nowadays, in the post 3 CP world, you can use Rampart three times and give yourself just three heavy barricades that your opponent now has to manage. And if you also excavate those, you also ignore them. Yeah. You have heavy terrain that is invisible to your, to your dwarves. Or maybe you can imagine like a little tunnel that goes underneath it. But I don't know. It's, it's a really big investment to, to give three CP for three barricades. Because you need yeah. you need the the other CP as well, but there are some maps where you can really play it so safe that you you put your two gunners that uh, one gunner ignores obscuring uh, in his own rules, and on the other gunner you put the non obscuring token from the locator, and then you have a shooting shooting fortress in your own uh, half. Where you can be shot, especially yeah. on into the dark. It's powerful. That's where I've definitely seen the Hearthkin kind of shine as a shooting team. I think Ace's way of playing the Hearthkin were a counterpunching team where you have a couple dwarves go to the midline, get killed, and then everyone else has a knife and goes and stabs those people. <laughs> you basically like chain stabbings until people are like out of to out, out of operatives and your last three guys just like nuke everything because everyone else has grudge tokens. But on the flip yeah. side in New York, we had a player at the last New York Open who used excavation tools and lots of aggressively paced barricades so that he could create asymmetric charges yeah, and also have a good shooting fortress. So being able to use the no obscurity and being able to just set up safe spots that overlook your opponent's objectives, those are two different ways that you can kind of adjust. And being able to synthesize both of those playstyles is probably where Hearthkin players are now finding more results because me and Jason have seen over the last couple of weeks of doing our weekly stat show on Patreon that Hearthkin have had weeks where they're winning a handful of like three or four round tournaments pretty consistently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have to, you have to know your opponent's team and what to play in which situation you cannot, there's not one go-to uh, plan for, for those, for the dwarves. Yeah. Hearthkin really no. is what, another one of those big brain teams where like, you got to really know what you're doing. You have to really know the map. You have to know what your opponent's doing. You have to have a plan. Like, each of your operatives, you could have a different plan for. And there's just, like, a lot of wrong plans out there. But if you can crack the code and figure it out, like, it seems like there's something there. I'm just, like, personally not patient enough to figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> it's like Warp Coven. That's what I like about... I like about the team is that um, you find so many small things after a long period of time playing them that you can that you didn't notice in the first place. Yeah, it's a deep puzzle to solve. You have to like it. You have to like it. Yeah. But I do. But I also do like uh, to play a low brain load team like intercession once in a while, where you just play out of the box without any rule books because you know the uh, this this little rules by heart. But if you really want to play a complicated, strategic, uh, um, meaningful game, then it was also pretty good. Yeah, the more words you have, the more ability you have to play a really <laughs> deep, complicated game. Whereas when you're playing Six Intercessors, you are just playing a very tight tactical game. Or in Jason's case, you're playing a very strong kick the hornet's nest as one guy murders six operatives on the opposing team. Yep, five dudes kick the hornet's nest and Doom Guy slays all. <laughs> yeah um i i had to, i have to try this out because when i played intercession i had at least six points equipment points on the leader like the bolts and the and the, the scope but you can use all 10 to put it on and the... use all 10 yeah uh i mean i think i got him up to nine most of the time because I would, I would give him um the bolts and the scope and then i'd also give him an auspex and a knife so then he, he yeah. falls one short, but the Auspex is helpful, like, shockingly often. Yeah. Yeah, we've got a, our oh, whole list of Doom guys out on our YouTube channel. For anyone who's <laughs> never seen our YouTube channel, <laughs> take a yes, look sometime. we did a whole a tier list on every single faction and how well do they Doom guy. <laughs> it's nice. <laughs> Spoiler alert, Intercession is S tier. Yeah, I think all the other major combos were compendium teams that can like boost damage so like grey knights were up there 
and a couple other silly things. To be fair, I think these like Doom Guy things are really fun ways to let people kind of learn the game because I don't know how you've been doing in June, but generally I tell people to just play without equipment and tack ops initially and just kind of play horde modes where you're playing like three intercessors, you're killing a bunch of orcs, you get vantage, they don't. And then as you size up, you can like give people experience or equipment and you can give them tech ops. Mm-hmm. So That's one of the fun play. ways to like coalesce all of those points, you know, we just had a new player come to one of our local tournaments. She had a lot of fun, but she asked me like, oh, what should I do? And I was like, well, just put all of your equipment point on your leader and then have the other guys go out and just have the leader go last. And she had a lot of fun because even if she wasn't winning, the leader that could do everything is a fun Swiss army knife. So a lot of these yeah. other compendium doom guys also get those vibes. Which other uh, compendium doom guys are there? Okay, hold on. We got to show there's two that we got to <laughs> shout out real quick. One of them is Grey Knights who ends up with a storm bolter that hits on twos relentless. And then he's got like five power sword attacks that hit on twos and he can give himself plus one damage. So he'll have seven damage crits that he's going to get a crit. He can have a two up save and he can cast spells for free, including like no cover, <laughs> um, that plus one to melee damage, like I talked about. And then the other one that doesn't matter, it's like gives him a two up armor save, which he already has. Um, but then you also boost his storm bolter up to four five. So he shoots twice with a what? relentless four five bolt gun that you can also give like no cover. And then you can also have he can have super conceal because all gray knights can. You can give him like a 10 inch charge because all gray knights can. He can fight twice. He can shoot twice. He's a monster. And he saves on twos. And he saves on and twos. He saves on twos. <laughs> it's insane. He's a villain. Yeah. Um, gray speaking of one of my first teams as well. Yeah, yeah I like them. they're great. Um, I've got a little I've got a Grey Knight kill team on the shelf and my my leader for it, like ever before I even figured out the Doom guy, I was like, my leader is going to be a, a Grey Knight Terminator. Um, and then <laughs> once I did that, I was like, oh, my. But I put him on a 32 for kill team. And I was like, oh, man. Yeah, I just like modeled the, the Grey Knight Doom guy. Um, and then the yeah. other one is the Compendium Chaos Space Marine. And Travis, did you want to uh, shout that one out real quick? Yeah, so the Chaos Compendium Trader Space Marine, he gets eight cultists that run around and waste everyone else's time while your leader gets to do the Doom Guy thing where he's got, I think, extra damage. So his his bolter gets P1. If So if you want to be able to double shoot, you can't take the plasma gun. You got to be able to take the, the bolter. It gains ceaseless and then you get one extra one extra damage to your attack characteristic. So instead of having a four attack, I think five attack leader, you get six attacks for your melee weapons. Which means that you're striking with a power fist with lethal five or brutal on a power fist. And then you also get to heal on kill. So you've got a double fight, double shooting bolt pistol with P1, which is not the worst profile. And it hits on twos, you, rerolling ones. So it's actually yes, like it some of the best shooting in the game. Like it's straight up yeah, better so than like, guard plasma and it shoots twice. Yeah, it's pretty reliable. Just like, you know, just having a lot of attacks that's reliable. And then if you get a kill, you heal. So you've got 13 wounds, which is obviously not as good as intercession, but six attacks on twos, five, seven brutal or four, six lethal five with a heal at the end definitely means that he can take a hit and then keep cracking. And you can also give him a grizzly trophy, which works exactly the same as legionary. So he can just be like a melee monster that is untouchable and he can also shoot. Okay. It's like the, but it's not it's not the guy that transforms into a demon, right? The, no, the, he's the, not the, as good as that. But as far as Doom guys because, go, he's not bad. When, when I play against when I play against Legionnaires, there's always this point when when my friend transforms his model into this uh, demon, and then he says, "Okay, now he got this. Now he got that. He got lethal five, relentless, and blah." And, and I say, uh, "Okay, so he got basically every every special rule in the book, right? So you can't stop talking. He had just everything, and my guy's dead." <laughs> The important thing on In the Dark, though, is you can lock the demon in a room. Just so unless he has a handler, out. you can close the door and then just leave. <laughs> yep. Yeah. You cannot open doors. He's the biggest, he definitely biggest cannot scary open monster. Doors. Yeah. Cannot no find shooting, the no handle. That's actually how I won versus Felgor with my Corsairs on Into the Dark. Because when they are frenzy, they also cannot open doors. So with Corsairs, I also play... Uh, I play the first turning points i get a lead on primaries mm-hmm. and then i basically fall back it depends yeah, on the like opponent against felgor you can you can exactly do that 
I was running away from them and locking myself, my operatives all in one room, <laughs> and Fago couldn't reach me. <laughs> yeah, I mean that was your that's your other love of the team, right? You know, last week we had Adrian Bonavento on here. He was talking about how he really enjoys playing Corsair Voids cars. He plays them very tight, trying not to give too much room for their opponents to ever touch his operatives, and he is finding success with them locally. How have you been finding success with your Corsairs? Well, I'm not on so many uh, tournaments like the other guys that are um, in mm -hmm. podcast. And so maybe um, in total, I was on four or five tournaments Okay, by now. And when I played Corsairs, I always placed really in the middle ground. Like I won two games, played a tie and lost one game. Or I lost one and win three. Yeah, it was perfectly balanced. But sure. the more you play a game, and I, I really like that when you have uh, the rules for your team by heart and you don't have to use a book anymore and you know exactly what, what the guys can do. And it's such a good feeling to to be in control of those little things. Because with the dwarves, even after some months of playing them, I still have to look into the into the book and look which synergies are played when and is this ploy now really worth playing. But with Corsairs, I just know it's in my brain what I can do. Mm -hmm. Like the double. So with Corsairs. Yes, the warp folding, the switching stuff. Yeah, with Corsairs on tournament play, you know, obviously a big part of being becoming a better player in tournaments is being able to sit back and kind of think about your game and retrospectively think about what kind of mistakes you made and how you could fix them. In those tournament games, what do you feel like you could have done better? Because obviously that's a thing that I'm sure other players struggle with. So with Corsair Voids cars, what kind of mistakes do you think you need to cut out of your gameplay? Hmm, interesting. Well, Corsairs is a pretty CP-hungry uh, team, like Hearthkin. And if you... I, I basically never spend... Uh, differently than Adrian, because I listened to the last episode, he said... Uh, or oh, was it the other guy? He always spends CP on, on tactical rerolls, on CP rerolls. That was Adrian, was yeah. He, he Basically, covering for the times when your four attacks on threes doesn't do yeah. anything. Just because the team does, has no baked-in rerolls, the best you have is if you spike and get a crit, you get to get a hit, yeah. which is not super reliable, even though it is easier to trigger compared to where it was you know, before I, uh, the patch. I never, I never play... Uh, I, if I can, I manage it. I, can, I, I never play CP rerolls because then the CP are missing because... TP1, you need the, the movement thing, and also Light Fingers is really helpful. And that's two CPs. And then you play the um, the Outcast thing, where uh, outside of three, you get a failed uh, turn to a normal hit if you roll a crit. That's also really helpful. And you need those CP until the end. So you can't really afford to have a CP reroll. That's what I did wrong also in, in tournaments. And what what I also did wrong is um, it's the activation game. Because Corsairs have a double activation, which is really powerful, but against a team that out-activates you, it, it might be not as good an idea to do this double activation, because then you are finished and your opponent has more operatives. Yeah. And so maybe a little I, bit too gung-ho with your leader's coordinated strike where you chain activate another operative within three inches of him. Yeah, or um, I'm, too, I'm too nervous and put the, the guys not in three inches of the leader. <laughs> that happened uh, several times that I, I looked and they were like four inches away from each other. I couldn't double activate them. So a little bit of spacing stuff. I think spacing is one of those very easy things to miss as you're learning about the game like oh yeah you know you just place your operas wherever but that first time you get caught by blast definitely you try to remember you got to be more than two inches away and then the first time yeah. you miss your medic you're like oh, i definitely need to be within three inches away so there's like a very big sweet spot between two and three inches where you generally want to be in at least as far as kill team is concerned of course until and, someone uh, hits you with the uh... blast three <laughs> yeah I am um, in my early um, games. I also tended to overcommit um, too much, risking um, unnecessary, uh, uh, doing unnecessary risks. Like with Cordas, you have this flying guy, the, the Shade Runner, 
mm. who's always an, an objective guy. But if you if you're too greedy with your with your tech ops or with points, then he dies too soon, and he's really important because, like the jetpack guy, he can get everywhere and shoot silent and everything. But I tend to lose him too early, <laughs> or I lost him too early in tournaments. Yeah, I think making sure that you know which operatives you can lose early and which operatives you can't lose is definitely a, a really big part of just the whole kill team flow. You know, your one random dork that has a gun go off and stand in the middle objectives. And when he gets yeah. killed, now everyone else can go do other stuff. Making sure you've got spacing so that your leader can chain activate or having the psyker cover, cover your other operatives so you can switch places when need be. Definitely important stuff. Yeah. I think positioning is is the the it's the um, how to say that it's the master the master class of kill team because if uh, I have some friends who they look at the board and they, you can see it in their eyes that they post, they they, they uh, process the game <laughs> like in hindsight and they see exactly where to put the, the operatives and if you deploy well then yeah. If you start off in good deployment, it's 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 really good. And there are those teams, and you can do it with Corsairs as well. You can, uh, after you deploy it, you can say for a CP, you deploy them differently. Forwards also have them. And I never understood why they why it was so strong. But you can really uh, lay out some traps for your opponent. You, you deploy like in a silly way. And when he doesn't uh, remember that you have to deploy, you take the, the guys out and put some other guys in or put them somewhere else. Yeah, there's also common tricks, or back in the day, there were some more common tricks about like putting operatives in the open with conceal orders. And then when your opponent tries to set up a model to play around your into the breach or whatever, you just put a barricade in front of him. And now your opponent has a gunner in the wrong position. But obviously, yeah. Phobos and Corsairs get to do similar things because you can redeploy people. Yeah, but Phobos, it's a little different. You can you can switch two operatives, but they have to stand in the same place. It's a bit silly. With Corsairs, you take two and put them on the other side of the board. But for Phobos, you can you you switch the operatives. So Phobos, you bench. Phobos, you can. Take no, there's, Phobos there's is redeploy two. Phobos is you fully redeploy two guys, so they don't have okay. to switch places. And they can switch orders. Yeah, and then the, and then the one that you're thinking of is like um, you can swap out an operative. And that that's like yeah. Um, I don't I don't even remember the that's timing on that. Ahead. Yeah, it's I don't like, think one step ahead is nearly as useful just because nowadays Phobos operatives, it, you know, they're good enough. Yeah, yeah. But elite yeah. reconnaissance, you can fully switch the positions and the orders for two operatives, so you can like bait people with bad setup and then move stuff around. And Australia's Jay, he was on here talking about how he jukes people out with Inquisition. Some of these teams can do similar things. I do similar things with free game movement. So on Vet Guard and on Pathfinders, you can set up like, oh, I'm going to get blasted. And then your opponent sets their gunner up in range and then you just scatter and your opponent's got nothing. <laughs> yeah, because everyone got a dash now. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's crazy play. It's a nice little trick. It's a good little way to get a little bit of value on people who have clearly gotten used to a little bit of autopiloting. They see like the see the situation, they go for it, and you're just like, well, I'm just gonna scoot out of the way. Yeah, but then there's always the player that is even better than you and he sees it coming and he puts his gouting phase in, in a way that he will start first and counter that deployment thing. Yeah, an underutilized portion of the game for sure, I think. A lot of people just take take things kind of without thinking about it, but if you are paying attention to what your opponent is doing on setup and what they want to do, being able to snipe the first turn activation if there are boards that let you do something useful on the first turn, definitely still important. Well, June, you know, we're getting towards the end of this podcast. Are there any other big things that you want to call out about the your nor your local scene in Leicht? <laughs> Definitely. Well, Leipzig. <laughs> Leipzig. <In> Leipzig. <laughs> um, yeah, tell us a little bit or, you know, any last call outs for anyone in the area, anyone in Germany who's listening, maybe they can help find you or the local tournament coming up in August. So give us some final shout outs for your local scene and what's coming up. 
Um, yeah, I want to thank the the. It's basically a friend of mine. He started with Kill Team, and uh, he he um, found out that it's not his. Um, favorite thing to do but then he started to shoot some uh, videos and photos about, um, about the game and he's this little has this little crew called playmates gaming it's a it's a twitch stream where they uh they stream tabletop game games yeah that's a really cool guy and he will do another videos of our upcoming tournaments as well so play t um, playmates gaming on twitch is really a good a good thing um Yeah, the thing is that it's really, I think it's a small scene right now in Germany, but um, the guys in the in the Western part are doing a really good job also with the Discord and connecting people and, yeah, keep up the good work. And, yeah, I hope more people play Kill Team because it's the better game and it's more fun. It's, it's cheaper and, yeah, play Kill Team. <laughs> Agreed wouldn't be here if we didn't enjoy kill team so all good there yeah thanks for coming on and thank you listeners for listening until the end yeah it was a fun thing to do and a pleasure to, to be on the podcast because i really like it and, and how you do it well soon you and your friends will hear you on it so. yeah 